We are going live and I believe we are officially on. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to another session of our Sussex Vision Seminar Series, as always, within the Worldwide Neuro Initiative. I'm George Cafetzis, a master's graduate from Thomas Euler's lab and currently a PhD student with Tom Baden. And as your host for today, I would like to once again begin by thanking Tim Vogels and Panos Bozelos for putting forward this uh, blossoming, ever-expanding initiative towards a greener and much more accessible seminar world. Having said that, allow me, of course, to get back to the reason we all gathered here for today and introduce our guest from University of Exeter, Dr. Jolion Trosianko. Following his undergraduate in biological sciences and master's in integrative biosciences from University of Oxford, Jolion went on to University of uh, Birmingham, where, uh, supervised by Jackie Chappell, he obtained in 2012 his PhD on cognitive, ecological, and morphological aspects of tool use in New Caledonian crows. As a postdoctoral fellow, he first joined Cambridge and the lab of Martin Stephen and Claire Spottiswood before arriving in Exeter in 2013, where he has been located ever since and soon starting as a lecturer. From his uh, doctoral studies on how I and Bill morphology could have evolved to enable tool use in crows, to his uh, postdoctoral and current focus on how camouflage and switching between different strategies affects uh, survival in the real world, Jolion has additionally been developing throughout these years uh, methods for uh, repurposing commercial equipment like a typical camera into multispectral, scientifically appropriate imaging tools. Uh, today's topic is uh, centered on theoretical and modeling aspects of color appearance, and we'll have the pleasure of hearing about their latest and I'm sure exciting work Uh, together with Daniel Osorio. So without any further ado from my side, please all welcome uh, Dr. Trosianko. Uh, Jolion, the stage is officially all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, absolute pleasure to be here and slightly daunting as a, uh, as a visual ecologist uh, to talk to such a, a broad audience. Uh, right, I'm going to start sharing my screen. And George, if you could let me know if it's working. Yes, we can see it. Excellent, excellent. Uh, right, so um, I, yeah, I am a visual ecologist. So what does that mean? Um, that means I, I think about how animals look, how they see the world, and how those things affect their, their evolution, um, their behavior, their survival, their conservation. Um, so there's a lot to unpack here. And actually, uh, one of the main hypotheses that I've tested so far um, relate to how camouflage works. Um, so camouflage is a really important aspect um, of, of visual, visual ecology. It's, it's the most common anti-predator um, defense strategy, um, probably in nature. You know, visually guided predators are really common and the best way to protect yourself from them is to just uh, go unseen. So here's a beautiful picture of a nightjar um, and I did a lot of work on um, nightjars uh, in Africa. And the, the camouflage is under such intense selection pressure. So it's always an interesting to, to look at from an evolutionary perspective. So in order to understand camouflage, uh, camouflage is a function, of course, of the way an animal looks and how it matches its background uh, or otherwise. And of course, lighting is important, but critically, receiver vision is important. So the way an animal looks uh, is always evolving under pressure from the intended receiver, whether that's a predator trying to find prey or signaling a uh, sexual display. So I'll, I'm gonna start by just giving a very brief overview of some of the kind of important hypotheses I test, which kind of will feed into why uh, the visual modeling that I'm gonna present later is particularly useful for me, hopefully useful anyway. Um, so in this work, this was trying to understand why um, dichromacy is so common in so many animals. So in humans, red, green color blindness is, is fairly common. It's common enough that it's not under intense selection pressure to go. Um, and in many other primates, actually all the males are dichromats. And so there's the argument that maybe there's actually a selective advantage to being a dichromat. And one of the ideas there is actually that, that red green vision is not useful for breaking through camouflage. So uh, I did some previous uh, research that tried to look at this. Uh, so we had people um, trying to find pictures of camouflage night jars as fast as they could under simulated dye or trichromatic vision. So that's the two images you see here. Um, can you see my cursor, by the way, if I move it around? It's probably too small to see, isn't it? I don't um, know if it's part of the camouflage, but we can definitely see it um, excellent. Like small, but we can see it, yeah. Uh, so on the left here, you've got the, the nut jar with red-green and on the right uh, without red-green, so just with blue-yellow color. 
And we found, consistent with many other um, uh, pieces of research, actually, that, that there's no, no advantage to being a dichrome. And actually, red-green color vision does always help. But this, this shows the importance of understanding the, the, the color vision of the receiver. Uh, another critical aspect of camouflage uh, is predator learning. And that's a much less intuitive one, perhaps. Um, so here we have some pictures of green shore crabs. This is all one species of crab and they have incredibly high levels of polyphenism. That means that although it's one species, they can all look incredibly different from each other. And so understanding the sources of this, this diversity of appearance in nature is, is, is very interesting. And one of the key ideas here is that it's uh, frequency dependent selection. It's the predators learning to find the, the crabs um, which drives diversity in appearance. So what does that mean? For example, uh, a bird or a fish trying to find a crab might stumble across this mottled one at the bottom left. Um, and then it holds a search image in its head of mottled crabs. And um, somehow it uses that search image to focus very well on mottled crabs and finding them. But it might just walk straight over the pale crab or the dark crab. So holding a search image for one crab makes you efficient at finding one crab, but inefficient at finding other moles. So we can test um, theories like this. So this leads to negative frequency dependent selection. Yeah? You want to look different to everyone around you. Um, so a common method that we use um, to test theories like this is simply like online camouflage games. Basically, where's Wally? Uh, people love playing these online games. So you present people a screen like this, get them to find the crab as fast as they can. Um, and unbeknownst to them, we were giving people a series of the same crab again and again. So they'd learn to find one crab. And then we'd switch them to another crab and see how switching interfered with their search image. And this graph shows how easy it was to switch from one morph to another. So at the top of the, the graph uh, um, on the horizontal axis, you've got all the different kinds of, of crab morph. So let's say you start by learning a green crab. Um, once you've learned to find green crabs really well, and then if you go down here and you're switched to a pale crab um, uh, on the, the vertical axis, the very high number here shows it took a long time for people to switch from a green to a pale crab. It took them an extra half a second on average. Um, so if you're a, um, in a population of green crabs, you really want to be a pale crab. You don't want to be, for example, another green crab because then you're found quite easily. Um, so this shows how uh, learning is important to camouflage. But another aspect that came out from this research was that edge disruption was very important to how predators learn to find camouflage and the general importance of camouflage overall, how, how effective it could be. So what do I mean by edge disruption? Edge disruption refers to the, the concept that the main thing that gives away uh, a target, uh, whether a prey to a predator, for example, the main thing the predator is looking for is the overall outline of that animal. So here we've got two um, artificial uh, prey, we've got triangles, and edge disruption refers to the technique where you use high contrast markings on your edges to interfere with the, the perceived edge. So on the left here, we've got very disruptive edges where the markings go right to the edge. And on the right, we've got a, a homogeneous edge, an intact edge with no edge disruption or much lower edge disruption. Traditionally, though, this was a very difficult, it was a difficult thing to define and even more difficult to measure. And we, we, we knew this was important, but there was no good way of doing it. So I developed a method that could, could try and get at this. And it, it's fairly simple. You, you use Gabor kernels. So these, um, many of you might be familiar with this. This is an oriented uh, filter um, that detects edges, essentially, at different orientations. You run this around the edge of the target and see how strong the edges um, of the animal are, the, the true edge of the animal. And then you run it, the same filter, you, you flip 90 degrees and see how strong the edge is at 90 degrees. So you're at every point around the edge of the animal, you're measuring its actual edge intensity versus its um, fake edge intensity. Uh, the, the, and you just take a ratio between the two and you, you sum around it. And you end up with this, this we've, we've called it Gabrat um, methodology. And actually it's, um, it turns out to be one of the best predictors of, of, um, of camouflage, how effective camouflage is for humans um, doing um, camouflage tasks like this. It beat all sorts of much more sophisticated methods for trying to identify you know, pattern matching and feature matching and so on. Another interesting thing though is, um, you'll see the little sigma three, um, that was um, actually at three cycles per degree. So 
the this Gabrat method worked most effectively when we used a Gabor kernel that was at three cycles per degree. And by that, I mean um, uh, how many cycles you have per visual angle of degree. So if you have a very tiny filter, you'd have lots of fine stripes and a very uh, large filter would be big stripes. Um, so stripes where you have three stripes per degree were the best. And this kind of will come up later as being an important thing. But it also highlights the importance of spatial information in camouflage and visual ecology generally. And this is an area where the field has been very slow to, to kind of latch on to what we know must be true. But um, spatial information is, of course, in, super important to with the way camouflage works and signaling. So if you take this, this incredibly uh, toxic moth that's displaying its bright coloration patterns um, up close, these patterns are very, uh, very salient, they're very easy to see. And so here we can simulate what it looks to, like to a human at two meters. But as you get further and further away, those colors blend together. And so at 32 meters, you can't see those stripes at all anymore and they blend together and become perfectly background matching. And this is a key strategy that you find again and again in nature. Something can be signaling up close, but actually perfect, perfectly background matching at a slightly larger distance. Um, and traditionally, we, we've only looked at this kind of acuity limit. Um, uh, so this is kind of uh, the state of the art at the moment. Very few people are considering anything more than just the visual acuity uh, limiting the, the, the stripes you can see, for example. But it's very important. Another aspect of the visual modeling I use is, is understanding color detection uh, and, and being able to uh, discriminate colors uh, between objects. So obviously that's important from a camouflage concept, but also for a pollinator finding a flower, making sure that flower stands out uh, clearly from the background. So in this research, um, I'm gonna present it was using uh, moths and flowers. So hawk moths, uh, nocturnal hawk moths are actually, they're trichromats um, with receptors sensitive to, to green, blue and ultraviolet ranges. Um, but incredibly, they have very low light vision. So this color vision of theirs can work down to starlight levels of illumination. So it pretty much never gets dark enough for their color vision to switch off. When it gets past, you know, much past dusk for humans, our color vision stops, we switch to rods, we don't see color. These guys are acting just like bees. They're using the color of the flowers to find, um, to find the flowers at night as if uh, nothing were changed. Um, and they're very important pollinators. They're about as important as bees are for pollination networks. But we wanted to understand how artificial light types interfere with the ability of moths to see these flowers. So when it comes to modeling um, uh, color discrimination, um, the field is very dependent on models such as this. Um, there are a few models, but this is one that we use a lot. It's the receptor noise uh, limited model. Um, and it's, it's incredibly useful because you don't need to know a huge amount about the animal visual system for it to work. So the model assumes that the thing that um, defines detection thresholds is, is mostly um, neural noise. Um, this stops you being able to, for example, work out whether two uh, colors are different or not. And you don't need to know a huge amount about the visual system, just its spectral sensitivities and um, cone ratios and a bit of behavioral validation. Um, but it has its limits, um, um, like, like all models do. But we use this model to, to simulate how these flowers might look to a, to a hawk moth under different lights. So here's uh, an example of a foxglove um, to human vision on the left, and then to elephant hawk moth under different light types. Now these images all have the same white balance. Um, so the different colors here are colors generated by these weird light sources, very spiky uh, light sources in some cases. For this modeling, we didn't actually use photographs, we used spectra, but this, this gives a nice visually appealing idea of what's going on. So for this research, we simulated the ability of hawk moths to see flowers against their surrounds, so green surrounds, under different light types um, on, on the, the vertical axis here and different light intensities on the horizontal axis. Um, so where you've got broadband white light, so daylight, metal halide and white LEDs, all these green boxes show that the moths would be able to see colors as well as they would be able to see them under moonlight. And then the black boxes show that there would be inhibition of color vision. So where you have low pressure sodium and orange LEDs, very narrow band orange sources, um, blocks all color vision as you'd expect. The really interesting finding though came with these broadband amber 
uh, light sources. So here, these are high pressure sodium, a very common uh, light, light source, and PC amber LEDs, which are held as a kind of more potentially more eco-friendly future light source. Um, we found that you get a really interesting interaction between light intensity and ability to see the flowers. They also vary by flower color. Um, so here, uh, purple and um, uh, yellow flowers are split into, into different groups here. What this means is that you know, a purple flower right under a street light would be incredibly easy for the moth to see. In fact, it might be easier than it would normally under moonlight. But then that same flower slightly further from that same street light, um, just with slightly lower intensity, that street light will actually block, it will inhibit the ability of the moth to see flowers, uh, the flower color. And so this could have unknown uh, consequences for their ability to pollinate. So throughout the work I've shown so far, each study really depends on visual modeling, whether that's comparing color or brightness, pattern, edge disruption, all of these things. Um, so hopefully uh, this gives you an idea that effective visual modeling is really critical uh, in our field uh, for all sorts of reasons. But there's really quite a big elephant in the room, particularly when it comes to modeling brightness or, or luminance. Um, so take this hypothetical example, uh, which we might often uh, encounter in my field, of which, which crab is brighter. Uh, so the, the average of these two crabs might, you know, the average reflectance might be identical, but the one with high contrast at the bottom to me looks slightly brighter. And, you know, so, it's, it's difficult to, to know at what scale from if you remember back from the, the um, spatial um, viewing distance related uh, modeling um, that can have a big influence. But we can make it even more complicated now by considering that the same crab might be on different backgrounds. And now, so what I've done here is take the, the, the top crab and duplicate it on a, on a light and a dark background and the, the bottom crab again duplicated. And to me, the one on the left looks brighter now than the one on the right. But this effect is more intense in the lower crab than the upper crab for me. Um, and some of you will recognize this as, as simultaneous contrast. Yeah, the, the, the crab against the dark background is looking lighter. And, and um, sure enough, we, we do find this effect. And people have uh, tried to, to model um, the current sort of state of the art um, uh, luminance modeling in non-humans is, is really actually quite crude and it doesn't perform very well in behavioral tests. So really nice behavior, ex, behavioral experiments on triggerfish um, that show that actually the current models don't really work very well and this simultaneous contrast effect, um, uh, it, it's difficult to explain. So this is another version of the, uh, that same crab simultaneous contrast effect. The, the gray bar in the middle is actually all one gray level. You'll find that impossible to believe but this gray on the left is the same as that gray on the right, if you were to actually measure it. And this uh, gradient in the surround is what makes this, this effect. So many of you will already be sort of familiar with, with visual phenomena like that. Uh, and there are, there's a huge plethora, a huge um, number of these visual phenomena which have been described um, in, the, in the human world. So those of you more familiar with the human uh, vision modeling world will be familiar with uh, a lot of these things. And so, a lot of these uh, phenomena have been explained by sort of um, very high level uh, sort of uh, functions like it depends on lighting and atmospherics or your you know, 3D perception. Um, but also there have been lots of attempts to make low level uh, models, um, which tend to, to, to explain some phenomena, but it's rare that, that they're able to explain many and they tend to involve lots of feedback loops and um, not tend to be generalizable or neurologically very plausible. So slightly undaunted by the you know, centuries of work on all of these uh, <laughs> uh, phenomena, uh, I, uh, I just wanted to know how to model the brightness of the crab. So during the lockdown, I spent lots of time uh, sitting down and, and doing lots of coding and thinking uh, about how this might work. And these, I'll, I'll just explain a few of these phenomena just to, to give a flavor of how weird and different they can be. So I've already introduced this, this simultaneous contrast one, this gradient, this gray block looks uh, like a gradient against an inverse gradient in the background. So what that is showing is that if you get a gray and surround it by darker, you can make it look lighter. And if you make it, um, if you get the gray and surround it by uh, light, you can make it look darker. But the white illusion down here with these um, high contrast stripes does exactly the opposite. So here, this gray on the left is identical to this gray on the right. 
but the one on the right looks far lighter. And in this case, now surrounding, surrounding a gray by light makes it lighter and surrounding it by dark makes it darker. So we've got um, the white illusion uh, assimilation kind of effect. Um, but it's not just about changing the brightness, it can change contrast as well. So below the white illusion here, we've got um, a checkerboard target. And this internal checkerboard is the same internal contrast. The gray levels are the same on the left as they are on the right. But surrounding it by a high contrast versus low contrast background it makes it the internal contrast appear to change. And that same phenomena holds true with orientation. So this target uh, on the right here um, is, is the same contrast as the one in the middle and one at the bottom. But where the stripes go in opposite directions, it looks like much higher contrast. So there's a lot going on here to unpack and um, a lot to potentially uh, take on board, a huge number of different phenomena. But basically, uh, there are all sorts of ways of messing with uh, our vision. So where to start with this? Well, when modeling vision, I really wanted to consider contrast sensitivity functions. So these describe the ability of an animal to see sine waves of different contrasts of different spatial frequencies. And so we get this, these typical effects where humans, for example, are best at seeing contrasts, our highest contrast sensitivity is um, at about um, sort of four cycles per degree, which fits in, if you remember the gab rat, that was most effective at four, four cycles per degree, which is nice. Um, so this is a key thing. And in, our, in the world of animal uh, visual modeling, we have almost never considered these. Uh, there was a nice paper on zebra stripes and lion's ability to see uh, their stripes, but beyond that, contrast sensitivity functions have largely been ignored. So an interesting thing, humans are able to see contrasts, uh, so the difference between light and dark of about, you know, 200, uh, 200 to 1. But when you go out and buy a TV these days, you'll want to buy a TV that has a dynamic range that's insanely high, yeah? So modern HD TVs have a contrast, um, a dynamic range of, of about 10,000 to 1. So how can a system that has the, the highest sine wave sensitivity of, of a 200 to one contrast actually add up to this enormous dynamic range that's so much higher? It's, it's quite an interesting problem. But the plot thickens even more when you consider that neurons are incredibly noisy. So um, this work by, by Simon Laughlin showed that neural, neural coding is limited by noise and the dynamic range or the, the the range over which neurons work um, is matched to natural image statistics. Um, but the bandwidth of these neurons is, is extremely low. So for example, neurons can only code for about you know, 10 levels. So the highest they can encode for is about 10 times higher than the lowest they can encode for. And I'm gonna be using the word bandwidth quite a bit, and that is a difficult term because it's used in different contexts, but mostly in this talk, by bandwidth, I mean neural bandwidth, the ability of a neuron to code for, you know, when it's firing at its peak rate uh, versus firing at its lowest rate. The, the range that it works in between that is its bandwidth. So if you look at um, the range where a neuron is, is operating linearly, that's working within its bandwidth. It must saturate out at some point and it must have a point below which it can't, you know, it's a zero, it can't fire any slower. So how can neurons that can only encode, you know, 10, uh, 10 levels, a bandwidth of, of 10, um, give us a high dynamic range images of, of 10,000 to one. Why are we going out and buying these HD TVs? Big question there. Another, another important uh, way of considering about bandwidth is, is the spatial bandwidth. Um, so spatial uh, images, uh, images are normally broken down into different spatial components. So um, this work by uh, David Field uh, is important for showing how you can break down a natural image into lots of different scales. So on the left of the image here, we've got the Gabor filters again, um, at different orientations and at different sizes. And if you use these to break down an image, um, you get lots of information out and you break it down into different um, octave, uh, generally using an octave scale is sensible. Um, and breaking the image down into these different spatial components. Um, and bandwidth is often used in the spatial context, but as I mentioned, I'm going to be using it mostly in the um, neural context. So that's some background. What effect, um, when I was starting out, what effect did I really want to actually explain? Uh, of all those phenomena, they're not particularly useful um, quantitatively. I needed to get my teeth into an effect that 
um, we could model uh, nice and um, uh, quantitatively. And the crispening effect stuck out to me as a really important uh, one to start with. So the crispening effect, here, here we have a row of gray tiles. And that same row is showing three times. So these, these rows are all identical. The only difference is the brightness of the background. The, the, the crispening effect refers to the brightness differences caused by uh, the backgrounds. So if you look at the three, um, the three tiles on the left with a dark background here, there's a very big difference in contrast, the difference between this tile and this tile. They seem to be very large contrast differences, whereas the same tiles against the lighter background they seem to be very small contrast differences. The step in contrast is much smaller, the step in brightness, sorry. Um, and you get the equal and opposite effect against the light side here. Now, another effect is, is the simultaneous contrast effect going on. So if you look at, uh, the, take this square, for example, in theory, this, this gray should be identical, but actually to me, this gray looks more like this gray. So we have a sort of diagonal line here of equal gray levels. So background changes the contrast, but it also changes the brightness. You get um, uh, simultaneous contrast effects going on. But you can also get white illusions um, effects going on on this screen as well. So here we've got um, white surrounded by black, and this black actually makes this white look slightly less bright than this white. So we've got simultaneous contrast assimilation and contrast induction, or, or whatever you want to call it, all going on in one phenomenon. So I thought this is a very useful phenomenon to, to start with. And thankfully, there are good um, behavioral data uh, gathered by Whittle um, measuring this, this crispening illusion. So he laboriously got um, subjects to tweak these gray levels on a screen until the, gray, the dif difference in gray level between all of these patches looked um, equal. So this is an equal contrast step color space that is made. And the results um, are shown on the graph on the right here. So as this is the luminance that, that um, uh, on, on the x-axis and the equal brightness uh, contrast on the y-axis. The, the really important thing here in this curve, you'll see there's an inflection point. The curve is steepest at the background gray level. So you're really good at discriminating gray levels near the background and it tails off at the top and tails off at the bottom in this kind of interesting way. So here are the main uh, concepts that I wanted to, to draw into this model. Uh, so we have the crispening effect as a quantitative thing. The, the concepts of contrast sensitivity. So we, are, we can't see certain contrasts. Um, then we've got the, the concept that neurons have a limited dynamic range uh, and a limited bandwidth that they can code for, um, which ties into uh, the dynamic range of the natural scene. But we should also throw in some assumptions here about um, natural scene statistics. So um, this neural, um, neural dynamic range has, has been, um, it's evolved to match natural scenes. And so they should code uh, natural scenes efficiently. And by efficient, that means that the neurons should be firing. Um, they shouldn't always be saturating. They shouldn't always be sitting lying dormant. They need to be used across their dynamic range efficiently. Um, at different scales. And in pretty much all of these areas, I'm sort of wading out of my comfort zone. Um, so thankfully, I've had a lot of help uh, by, from collaborating with Daniel Osorio, who's been uh, really vital in giving me some um, uh, sanity checking and helping with the modeling. So what does the model do? Let's uh, just run through briefly uh, uh, what it does. So you start with an input image that you just split into um, a luminance channel, so a brightness channel, and, um, and color channels, uh, opponent channels, red, green, and blue, yellow. Then you, you split that image into different uh, spatial uh, scales. And you can either do that as visual systems do using center surround, so a difference of Gaussian kernel, or a Gabor, this is an oriented filter that I mentioned earlier. Um, so center surround you find a lot you know, from the retina onwards, there's lots of uh, cases where you have center surround um, imaging in, in, in the nervous system. What that means is you take this, this, this is called a kernel and you, you convolve the image with this, you move this kernel around the image at different sizes and you look at the center versus surround and you can do that with oriented as well. For chrom the chromatic side of things, there's less evidence of oriented chromatic filters. So we just kept center surround for those. Rather than a normal, normal convolution, um, I found it was actually important to apply a Michelson contrast uh, convolution at each point. So that means 
at each point you do a, um, a Michelson contrast of the center versus surround um, when you're convolving the image. That seemed to be uh, quite important. And the output is, is, is shown here. You, you just break the image down into lots of different scales, which hopefully many of you will be quite comfortable with. Then the model considers uh, contrast sensitivity functions. Um, so these describe, as I mentioned, the, the, the smallest detectable sine wave at different spatial frequencies. And you have these for luminance and also for the red, green, and blue, yellow channels. Um, so here I'm showing uh, the contrast now on, on a Michelson contrast level, because that matches the way the modeling works. And apologies in this image for the moiré effect. So what you should see is um, big bands on the left, and these should get smaller and smaller and smaller on the right um, until you've got very fine spatial frequencies here. But you get all these moiré horrid bands, so sorry for that. I've also flipped the axis um, because I've kept the, the axis here with um, contrast sensitivity functions. So people are used to seeing contrast sensitivity functions as a kind of inverted U like this. And so I've just kept that, um, uh, that, uh, that principle by inverting the, the, the Y axis here. So the first thing the model does is throw out all of the information that is uh, below this activation threshold. So um, the contrast sensitivity function tells you what um, sine waves will be invisible, um, and it just throws out all of those. Um, that should be quite uncontentious, hopefully. But there must also be an upper uh, saturation threshold above which you're unable to code for larger contrasts. So this is, to my, to my knowledge, uh, it's something that has not been actually considered in the visual modeling world at all. Um, but it's, it's very interesting, it must be true. So here we've got the, the output of um, uh, a, ret a monkey retinal ganglion cell um, from Darrington Lenny. As you increase the contrast, you have this nice linear region where the, 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 the neuron is firing faster and faster as you're increasing contrast, but then there must come a point at which they can't fire any faster. You know, there's, the, there's a physiological limit above which neurons simply can't fire any faster. Um, and this must be true of pretty much all um, neurons. Um, so this is an important assumption. And this is where the neural bandwidth comes into play. So this, this brings into the concept that um, neurons are firing, but they do not have a, a, an unlimited bandwidth. There's a point at which the contrast sensitivity function means that they're not firing anything at, at the bottom. And then there's a point at which they, they stop being able to fire at the top. So our model makes the, the assumption, the potentially large assumption, but we need to make this assumption, that the bandwidth of neurons at different spatial frequencies is the same. And if we make that assumption, then the bandwidth um, is uniform, then the dynamic range must scale uh, as a function of activation threshold, the contrast sensitivity. So that's what this blue line shows here. If we have the the activation threshold, the point below which you're not seeing any contrast. Then we'll also have the saturation threshold, that point at which the neurons can't fire any faster. And that's shown here. So um, another way of showing this is with the same image. Um, if we assume that the bandwidth is four, so those neurons can code for um, any number between one and four times that number, um, then we have uh, uh, a situation like this where the contrast sensitivity specifies the activation threshold and the saturation threshold is four times that. So really interestingly for humans then, you, you have neurons uh, at, at the peak of our spectral, uh, of, of our spatial sensitivity, this four cycles per degree where we're really sensitive. You have these neurons that are really ready to fire. They're just, you know, tiniest little bit of information and bam, they will fire very quickly, but also therefore they will saturate very quickly um, as well. So they've got a limited dynamic range, small dynamic range, but high sensitivity. Whereas at the low and high spatial frequencies, we have a very low sensitivity, which gives this enormous dynamic range. Um, and so this is really interesting, um, combining different dynamic ranges with the same bandwidth. Then the next thing the, the model does is is whiten the image. So some of you might be familiar with that concept. When you break the, 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 the natural scene, for example, down into spatial scales, you've thrown away the, the, the sub-threshold and saturated information. Then you, you whiten the image so that every band, every spatial band has the same amount of contrast going on in it. 
So we're whitening it, making equal energy in each spatial band. And the size of the black arrows here shows the size of the gain, if you need to do that. Um, and all of these green bars have been stacked so that the all of the sub-threshold information has been lost. So this is, this is what the model's doing at each spatial scale. Then the model simply pulls uh, all of these spatial bands back together again, and you get some, some pretty funky looking output like this. Um, so this output, I should say, has not been calibrated to look sensible on monitors. This is a, a model of an internal representation in someone's brain. It's not meant to look nice, but, but actually you get a really cool image out of it. It's a cross between an impressionist painting and one of those high dynamic range images you see. Um, so walking through this bluebell wood is really disappointing when you, you're walking through the woods, this lovely bluebell display, you take a picture of it, and you can't see the bluebells. There's just they're so small. Whereas this model predicts that you've got this beautiful kind of impressionist painting style, you know, sea of blue, which is much more as I remember the scene looking. Um, and it and it shows uh, much higher details in in high contrast parts of the image. You know, you can see into all of the ivy, which is really black. You can see all the leaves. Um, so great, quite interesting output. Um, but there's a there's a key unknown parameter in this model so far, and that is that bandwidth. So in the, the image I showed a minute ago, I assumed that the bandwidth was four just to make graphing it look easy. Um, but that's a pretty much unknown number. But what we can do is use these crispening data. So what we did is take the um, Whittle's input image that he used um, uh, and, and put all the gray levels that people came up with for equal gray uh, distances between these gray levels. And we, we fitted uh, the model um, to this image uh, and varied the, the bandwidth of the neurons and the simulated bandwidth. And you get really nice output um, that, um, that was able to match the um, Whittle's crispening data really well. So the green and the gray lines here show the two flavors of the model using either oriented or non-oriented. Uh, so the Gabor is oriented filters and the DOG is non-oriented filters. Um, and you get a beautiful fit to, to the behavioral data. And importantly, though, you can see what the number is that it gives you. And for the non-oriented filters, it's, it predicts the bandwidth is 15. So really close to that, that sort of 10 range. Uh, so Simon Laughlin was doing it on flies, and they had a range of about 10. In humans, it's probably about between 10 and 20 um, for um, retinal ganglion cells. So that number is really uh, seems to make sense. And interestingly, for the oriented filters, we, we test it using four orientations. and you're getting almost exactly a quarter of that 15 number. So 3.75 was the number. So these numbers that it's spitting out seem quite plausible um, in terms of um, neural dynamics. But we can actually test that more explicitly. So here we can go back to the, the Darrington and Lenny data. So these, these data were testing um, uh, a monkey um, magnocellular uh, retinal ganglion cells, showing it different sine waves uh, of different intensities of contrast um, at four cycles per degree. And as you increase the contrast, you get this linear range. Um, if we plot it on a linear axis, and it probably should be plotted on a linear axis, um, you get this linear region and then quite an obvious kind of saturating out effect. And our model actually, um, if we fit the model using the crispening data to get that um, 15 to one um, contrast. Um, those it creates a response curve at four cycles per degree that almost exactly matches um, the Darrington and Lenny um, uh, testing of, of monkey uh, uh, retinal um, ganglion cell responses. So this green line is our model's um, response, uh, predicted response. And it follows very nicely this linear region and then saturating out. Um, and both, so both Darrington and Lenny and our model uh, predict that at four cycles per degree, the contrast saturates at about 0 0.2, um, which is quite interesting. Um, so a really striking thing about this model is that it's throwing away vast amounts of information. At least it seems that way. So it's, it's good. Throwing out information is really useful because it's compressing the image quite dramatically. Um, and image compression is, is going to be really valuable for, you know, for processing and dealing, you know, efficient use of, of neural structures. But all of the gray here is, is being lost because it's subthreshold. All of the blue here is effectively being lost because it's oversaturated. How can you throw out so much information without causing some pretty weird effects? 
Well, actually, one, one answer is that the information isn't quite being thrown out. That there's a lot of overlap between neighboring spatial bands. So I can, I can illustrate that with this image here. So if we take this input image, again, apologies for the moire effect, but you've got um, large, uh, low spatial frequencies on, on the left here and very high spatial frequencies on the right, and then contrast low at the top. So a really basic image just to test the, the, you know, the, um, the landscape. Um, put this through the model, and here is the different um, difference of Gaussian responses. So low spatial frequency going through to high spatial frequencies. And the color coding on the right here shows which areas, um, in which areas the model is preserving information. So the green is the areas where the model is showing that the neurons are predicted to be operating in that linear within their, their bandwidth, working happily in their operating bandwidth. The blue areas is where they become saturated and the gray areas is where they're not firing at all. And what you notice actually is that there's, um, there's a lot of overlap. There's no single point in this space where um, it's all saturated in all spatial frequencies. There's always a few spatial frequencies that are, are operating at any one time. So if you, take, if you take this middle section here, down in the high spatial frequencies, you can actually detect contrast there and in the low as well. Um, and this is really neat because this can show you how you can potentially see um, extremely high dynamic range natural scenes or on a high dynamic range TV how you can actually still see information even by only coding it with neurons that have you know 15 to 1 um, bandwidth. But it doesn't explain everything. You're still going to be creating um, compression artifacts. You know, you can't throw away all this visual information without creating some odd phenomena. And that is excitingly where all of these things come in. Um, so we systematically tested um, over 35 different brightness and color illusions phenomena. Um, so these include things I mentioned before, like simultaneous contrast and spreading or white illusions, um, the crispening effect, of course, um, things that have been attributed to atmospheric or lighting or three-dimensional uh, effects, um, MAC bands and Hermann grid illusions, all, lots, lots of cool stuff. There's, there's a huge number of things. Um, but basically everything we would throw at the model, um, it, it, it qualitatively predicted it. So we came up with a model that was just fitted to trying to predict the crispening effect and um, neurophysi neurophysiological behavior. And we've come up with a model that as a byproduct actually seems to predict a bunch of these phenomena. Um, wasn't our explicit goal to match them, but matching them um, was quite neat. So here, for example, is Adelson's shadow illusion, um, quite a common one. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, this gray square here is an identical gray level to this one here, which is almost impossible to believe. Um, and shove it through our model, and sure enough, it predicts that this square should look lighter than that one. You can kind of get the same effect by taking out the low, um, low pass, um, so taking out the low spatial frequencies, um, but there are lots of other illusions that I could, I could show that that doesn't work on. So this is, it's a, it seems robust at doing illusions like this. Another nice thing about the model is you can actually interrogate it quite well. You can work out why you're just seeing the phenomena that, that it is seeing. So how is the crispening effect working? How can that be explained by this model? Well, if we have the input image here on the left, um, here we've got that same um, uh, clipping image with the same coding of blue being areas that are oversaturated. Green is where the model is happy and working linearly, and, and gray is, is where it's all subthreshold. Um, the model predicts the effect nicely. It's predicting that the, uh, so this graph is showing the areas of highest um, step in contrast between neighboring grids. And for the black background, it's highest on the left, and for the white background, it's highest on the right. But if we zoom in slightly, we can actually work out how, how this, is, this is working. So where you have um, in the middle here, we've got um, to the middle of the image, we've got grays that match the background gray quite nicely. And you'll see here, there's lots of green. So that means that the, these grays are working within the dynamic range. The grays are close enough that the model isn't oversaturating. So here at the white end, it's not oversaturating. And here it's not oversaturating and here a bit. Whereas we're getting a lot of saturation in other spatial bands. And this varies between the spatial bands. And when you sandwich these things together, it shows why contrasts that match your, the background, um, you're better at seeing them because more of your 
filters are working within their, their bandwidth than otherwise uh, would be at other bands. And so again, this, this hopefully helps explain why we can see these incredibly high dynamic range natural scenes or on TVs. Um, we're, 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 we're splicing together from a bunch of very minimal bandwidth, but very dynamic range um, sensitivities, um, shove them all together and you, you can actually see a lot of detail um, uh, at incredibly high dynamic ranges. The, I can't pronounce this, the Chevelle staircase um, illusion is a nice one to look at as well. Um, apologies uh, for my French. So the, uh, the idea with this illusion is really neat. You've got um, a bunch of different uh, steps in gray level. So um, this is just a square step down for, uh, for, from, from dark to light. And if you take this rectangle and flip it 180 degrees, that's what you have here. It looks completely different. It's amazing. Um, now it looks like a series of gradients rather than blocks of color. So how is this working? Um, and sure enough, the model does predict it quite nicely. Here, for example, the, the gray line, you've got the zigzags of gradients, and on the green line, you've got the steps. Um, and it does the controls of this um, illusion quite nicely too. The model explains this illusion because actually the staircase um, and the lower thing here is below your contrast sensitivity function um, at quite low spatial frequency. So this gray here, you see this is gray, you're not detecting the gradient at all here. Um, whereas you are detecting gradient, even uh, saturating out uh, in the upper one. So this can start to help explain uh, why you get this kind of effect. In fact, it can explain it fully. Now, so, so far I've just been talking about uh, uh, brightness phenomena, um, but it's interesting to talk about color as well. Um, and as a visual ecologist, I'm often taking photos of things, taking spectra of things using a white or a gray standard. Every time you do that, you make the assumption, uh, the von Kreese assumption that uh, of global um, uh, color constancy. But papers like this and others show that, uh, you know, that's, that's not true. Uh, color constancy um, is a function of local and global uh, effects. And so it's really nice to, to try and get around that because that's a really key part of, of, of our, imagine how important this must be in signaling. So color constancy illusions, this is a, a common one, this Lotto's cube. Um, in this illusion on the left, where it's all yellow surrounds, the blue, what looks like blue tiles, they're actually neutral gray. And on the right here, what looks like yellow, they're actually an identical matching gray. Um, and the surrounds make them, them look the colors they are. So this is, uh, this is demonstrating local uh, color constancy failing um, or global failing in favor of local on your screen at the moment. Um, so it's a really powerful effect. And sure enough, the model can, can simulate this nicely. It predicts that the, the ones that you would have guessed were yellow are yellow and blue are blue, et cetera. Um, so we can, we can have a look at that, but it also allows us to kind of combine chromatic adaptation and color constancy together. So chromatic adaptation means, you know, the global illuminant changing color um, and your eyes adapting with it. Take this, this scene of, of a forest I mentioned earlier, when you're walking around the, the forest, everything is pretty much green. Um, how do you work out the white point in a world that's green? Well, the neat thing about this model is this, this is a purely feed forward model. There's no feedback. Um, um, there's, uh, uh, there's no point at which any there's local um, um, normalization going on like there would be in a Retinex model. Um, if you multiply the scene, the red channel by five or the blue channel by five, you get pretty much the same output. The, the, Overall, the average scene still looks green and the bluebells still looks blue. So this kind of reconciles, hopefully, chromatic adaptation and color constancy with a purely feed forward model, um, uh, which is quite neat. And it can explain other chromatic, adap uh, chromatic illusions as well, um, like this uh, Brown and McLeod illusion where the, these colored squares against a gray background, they're actually the same colored squares are against this checker background the average of all the, the background colors is the same in both cases, but the ones uh, at the bottom look like more saturated than the ones at the top, and the model can explain this quite well. Um, and it also uh, predicts that you should have these interesting kind of um, uh, effects where the, the top looks more green than the bottom within each rectangle, uh, which is neat. So as a visual ecologist, I'm really interested in models that I can use for non-humans. So humans are, are obviously have the best data, but um, 
for me, I often want to know what the world looks like to a bird, for example. And if you look back at this contrast sensitivity um, uh, graph, you'll notice how birds have so much lower contrast sensitivity than humans. Yeah, this is about 10 times lower um, peak contrast sensitivity than humans. So what on earth would the world look like to them and how would our model look to them? And so that's another, hopefully, if the model is generalizable enough, we'll be able to adapt it to work with, with non-humans. Um, and if that's the case, then the world really does look quite dramatically different to them. Take this, this quick example of, uh, of that moth. The human would see much more detail than the kestrel, but those warning colors are actually sticking out nicely to the kestrel. And you can even look at distance dependent effects. And with the kestrel, from further away, the distance dependent effects would be probably much more powerful for the kestrel. And you see it's losing, it's washing out all of the high contrast information um, from behind like where it gets darker. Can't see into the dark bushes at all. So to summarize, this model uh, that uh, we've developed, it tries to integrate crispening effect and contrast sensitivity to have a, um, a, a perceptually uniform color space that also um, takes into account the fact that neurons have a limited dynamic range and uses spatial information um, uh, to work with that. Uh, so, uh, and makes assumptions relating to um, coding efficiency. Uh, squeezing all this information with, through neurons with limited bandwidth. And there's a chance, hopefully, that these are very generalizable principles and that therefore we will be able to use, adapt this model for use in non-humans as well. So, I, I really don't want to sell this model as a unifying theory of vision. You know, um, no model can ever do that. And um, no model is correct and, and some are useful is, is the mantra that we should all adopt. But being based on principles of, of efficient coding, hopefully it does make it quite universal, um, which remains to be tested. And it does reconcile uh, all of these weird phenomena with perceptually uniform contrast space, um, which is quite unique. Um, it's super, super fast. Like, Neurally, the model can be predicted with a single layer of neurons. So different weightings of input, bandwidth limiting of the neuron itself, and then different weightings of output is all this model ever needs. So it's somewhat neurologically plausible. Um, but there are, of course, limitations to the model as well. It makes a few assumptions. Um, the key assumption that we don't know whether um, bandwidth is uniform and that dynamic range therefore shifts with spatial frequency. So that'd be really fun to, to find out. And we need a lot more parameterization. We need more behavioral models to work out what's going on with the chromatic side of things. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. And I would be very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Jolion, for this uh, lovely and uh, I have to emphasize that very clear um, presentation, like for someone that is not so familiar uh, with uh, the field of modeling, the color appearance. Uh, I have to admit that I understand. I understood quite a lot. I already <laughs> went ahead yeah. and I posted the Zoom Room link uh, at the chat so people can join us already. Uh, and as a reminder to the audience, I will be stopping live transmission maybe in five minutes from now. Uh, so first question that I have is, um, I will start with the fact that you mentioned that this model is a purely fit forward model. Is it like, there are three different questions, but like the first one is like, is it surprising to you that uh, you can explain different illusions with just having a fit forward model? Like, would you expect some sort of, I don't know, feedback would be necessary? Like for example, for the time scales of, you know, this phenomena and how well, they occur. So fee feedback is, so, so common models at the moment of, that work with you know, chromatic adaptation, things like the Retinex model, they'll apply, apply um, effectively local normalization against a local maximum. So that's you know, local, you need a divide by number there. So you, you divide a color by its local maximum um, to get Retinex style models. And, and they work quite well. You know? um, the problem with, with anything that re requires feedback loops is that it would be slow, of course, neurologically slow. Um, and there's quite good evidence that you're able to see these, um, um, uh, these uh, contra uh, color constancy effects really quickly, like so fast that there would be limited time for you to have lots of feedback loops going on at a neural level. Um, so yeah, I found, it, I found it surprising that you could have a feed forward loop that always suggested that a green forest was green, even if you give it a red input. I, I find that odd uh, 
how can how can that how can that be so? But it does. It's neat, um, and you can explain how that works. Um, yeah, if you feed a red image in to a to a feed forward loop, why should you always get a, a green image out or, or a or blue image? I think right. It's which takes me to a second question. So in your model, uh, you say that for different spatial frequencies, you have the same uniform bandwidth. Do you have a different bandwidth for different signal opponents? Like uh, red, green, or yes. uh, blue, yellow, does it have the same bandwidth? Or this is Yeah, yeah, really good question. And that's where that last little comment I mentioned about where we, we struggle to parameterize the, the chromatic side of the model. So what we need is, um, so in short, no, we assume that they're different. Um, we assume that they're quite different. So we assume that the bandwidth, let's say, we could measure the bandwidth using the crispening data for luminance. But when it came to chromatic data, we don't have chromatic crispening data. Uh, so there are crispening data, but they're not the right kind that we would need. So we did an arm wavy assumption based on um, processing of natural scenes to come up with sensible numbers, but they do need behavioral validation. So no, the, the numbers that we ended up using for chromatic side of things were much lower. Um, so, for example, about you know five or, or so uh, bandwidth mm -hmm. about five, um, because if the, if the bandwidth was much higher than that, then the neurons would never be saturating in an, in an, in a natural scene, and that is not very efficient. I see. Thank you very much for that. So, uh, as there are no questions currently appearing in the chat, but people are already joining us. Uh, in case someone who is here wants to ask a question, they can raise their hand and they can you know. Um, uh, give them the opportunity to speak until we stop the broadcast and I officially waive my moderator rights. One last question that I have, uh, Jolion, from my side is, um, like I think, a quite general, general one and going back to purely feed-forward models. So because you say this is more bio biologically um, plausible, I was wondering whether, you know, like we know that the size of the receptive fields, like the extent of the center or the surround, can change based on the lighting conditions and so on especially for this around, like it can be much, much broader. Um, do you account for this in your model? Or would you think this would be important to account for in future attempts to improve it? Absolutely. Uh, so we have not accounted for that. We have just used the standard standard assumption of the surround being, what is it, 1.6 uh, times larger. Uh, so that would be, that would, I'm sure, dramatically change stuff. Um, uh, and it's easy for us to, to simulate what, what would, what effects that would have, but there are yeah, there's a number of parameters there, uh, such as that 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 you could tweak. But for simplicity, we've just started off by our rationale was what is the simplest model we can come up with um, that does the job, rather than we you know we can add layers of complexity later, but starting with the most parsimonious, the most kind of generalizable model, because particularly I'm interested in doing that for for non-human vision. I want something I can use for. Uh, for, for a non-human where we know so much less about the visual system itself. Of course, yeah. And like, I have many questions about aquatic animals as well, but given that <laughs> yeah. some people might be shy and don't want to appear live and ask their question, I will be stopping the live broadcast now. So, you know, we can have like a more informal uh, chit chat with people that are here. And I would like to thank you once again, uh, Jolion, for this uh, wonderful talk and for honoring us and giving uh, a talk in our series. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. So we are officially offline.